someone mentioned that perhaps this is a good time for a nap after Dan made mention of that. I think it got everybody in a sleeping mood. I said, no, the last hour was the time for a nap. This is the time for deep sleep. <laughs> this may be coma time. I don't know. Good to see each of you this morning. What a wonderful, wonderful crowd of people that we have uh, here today and, and uh, for this uh, kind of a rainy, dreary Thursday morning. And for many, uh, maybe a, a coming to the end of a long week, and yet we have this number of people that are gathered here today. And we appreciate so much the effort that you have put forth to be here, whether you're, you've been here all week or whether this is your first day. We certainly are grateful for your desire to be here, your encouragement to us in the work of the school, and certainly your presence here is a tremendous encouragement to us. You know, when we think about the great themes contained in the book of Genesis, we naturally think about some of the great things that we find in that wonderful book. For example, we can't help but think about creation and God's wonderful work in it. And obviously, we are reminded and we think of the entrance of sin into the world and the fall of the human race. We think of the worldwide flood and the great event that that was. We perhaps think of the stories of the patriarchs of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. When we think of the book of Genesis, we think of all of these wonderful themes. But in the midst of that, I think often, perhaps, or maybe far too often, we overlook the grand theme of redemption. And I'm certainly grateful for the opportunity to have been assigned the subject of redemption in the book of Genesis. And yet at the same time, when we consider what a grand theme that it is. It's easy to be overwhelmed by such a great theme and to think about the vastness of what the Bible has to say about God's great scheme of redemption for mankind. The very mention of redemption, I believe that the natural inclination is for the mind to race directly to Calvary, the sacrifice that our Lord made while upon the cross. To think about the fact that our Lord came into this world for the very purpose of offering his life and serving as the sinless and perfect Lamb of God slain for all the world. When we think about redemption, I believe that there are several pertinent passages of Scripture that just naturally come to our mind. For example, we are reminded of 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19 where Peter says, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as the lamb without blemish and without spot. What a great passage of scripture that that is. And perhaps we think about Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7 where Paul says, In him, that is in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. And so we see and we can clearly see that redemption is directly the result of Christ's death. That in his death the price for sin was paid. The satisfaction for the penalty of sin that was announced before sin ever came into existence. And Christ paid that price. However, the story of God's plan of redemption began much earlier than that. When we think about redemption, we've got to think not in terms of time, but eternity. Because in eternity, God formulated a plan for redeeming a sinful race. As a matter of fact, we find the very first mention of redemption very early on in the book of beginnings, very early on in the book of origins, very early on in the book for our study, the book of Genesis. 
And for our study today, when we think about God's scheme of redemption, we're limited to just some things that we might observe concerning it. Some things from the first 11 chapters of this first book concerning redemption. Time permitting, I'd like to suggest four things to you today and say some things about them. Let's begin by just noticing the plan of redemption. And to say some things about that plan that God has given. You see, God's plan to redeem sinful man is the scarlet thread that can be traced through all the way through the Bible. From the beginning of Genesis all the way to Revelation, we see that scarlet thread, God's plan for redeeming man. When you think about the vastness of this thought, it is that which permeates all of Scripture. It's not just something that we read about in the Bible. It is that which can be found in the Bible from beginning to its very end. Let me suggest to you that in the first two chapters, the book of Genesis, we have basically a period of perfection. That time where the Bible records for us and gives us a narrative of the creation account, God's wonderful work in creating all things. And after each day of that creation, God looked back on what he had done. And his assessment was, it is good. And then, when he got to the end of all of it, he looked upon all that he had done, and his assessment was, it is very good. Not only is it good, the idea there is it's perfect. God doesn't do anything that has anything less than perfection, and so it is a period of perfection. But when we get to chapter 3 of the book of Genesis, we see revealed there for us the purpose of redemption, and the entrance of sin in the world and the fall of man. And in Genesis chapter 3, verses 6, 15 and 16, we notice there the promise of redemption. When God said to the serpent that the seed of the woman would be victorious in crushing his head in utter defeat. As we move on to the book of Exodus and going on through the book of Esther, we see what we'll call some pictures of redemption. That is, some events. That is, some examples of uh, things that would help us to understand better what redemption is. Just think about God's people down in Egypt. And God raising up Moses to be the leader of those people up out of Egyptian bondage. We begin to learn some things about redemption in that. Moving on to the book of Job and going on through the Song of Solomon, we have some poems of redemption and I can't help but think about the great words of Job in chapter 19 and verse 25 when he said, I know that my Redeemer lives and he shall stand up on the earth. And then we notice the prophecies of redemption in Isaiah through Malachi. In the Old Testament, there are over 300 messianic prophecies. The prophets knew of the coming of the Messiah. They foretold of one that would come and who would satisfy the penalty for sin. As we move to the New Testament and the Gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we see there the presentation of redemption when Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. And ultimately, his life would end on Calvary's mount as he would die as the perfect sinless Lamb of God to appease the penalty for a sinful race. But then in the book of Acts, we see the preaching of redemption as the apostles and others began carrying out the Great Commission to take the soul-saving gospel and to preach it into all the world. And then in the book of Romans, on through Jude, in those wonderful epistles, we see the principles of redemption being expounded upon. And then finally, in the book of Revelation, we see the perfection of redemption as we begin to see glimpses of heaven ultimate enjoyment of victory over sin and over temptation and over Satan in this world and enjoy, enjoy and reap the benefits of redemption eternally. It must be understood, however, that God's plan of redemption 
It was not an emergency plan that was somehow just put into place following the fall of man to correct something that perhaps went wrong in God's plan. That certainly is not the case. But we notice that God had formulated a plan to save man before the creation of the world. Think about the words of Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, when the Apostle Paul attested to this fact when he wrote, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Paul says that he chose us in him when? before the foundation of the world. It's important for us to understand that when God created man, that he had already formulated a plan whereby he might save him. And then notice to Timothy, Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 1, in verses 8 and 9, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings of the gospel according to to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Notice, this grace was given in Christ Jesus, when? Before time began. And because of the foreknowledge of God, he knew that man would sin. There are those that have the idea that it's God's fault that man sinned if he knew that. But that's certainly not the case. Very simply, God understood and he knew beforehand that man would sin. Don't you think, don't you think that it is rather impressive that even though God knew before the fact that man would sin, that he went ahead and created man anyway? I believe that to be an extraordinarily impressive fact about God. And so he foreordained a plan to redeem man when he sinned. Edward Horton made this observation. He said the New Testament does not teach that God planned for man to sin so that he could save him. But rather, uh, Paul clearly tells us that God knew man would sin and purposed a redemptive plan which included Christ as the one to carry it out. And so God's plan of redemption was certainly no afterthought. Consider for just a moment those great words in John 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Think about that. We know that God loves us. We know that God loved us so much that he was willing to give his only begotten son. But don't you think that we ought to be impressed with the fact that God knew beforehand that man would sin? God knew beforehand that if man were to be saved, that he would have to save man. That he would have to provide the atonement. He would have to provide the sacrifice for that sin. Folks, it is beyond human comprehension that a loving God was willing to create man knowing that he would have to save him by sending his only begotten son to die to satisfy the penalty for sin. And the Lord instructed John to write in Revelation 13 and verse 8, All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been found written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Think about that. Jesus Christ was slain from the very foundation of the world. On Pentecost, Peter proclaimed of Christ, him being delivered by the determined counsel and the foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands and have crucified and put to death. Acts chapter 2 and verse 23. The sacrificial death of God's Son was not an accident, but rather we ought to notice that it was an appointment. It was an appointment, and redemption was planned out in the mind of God before the world was created. Having noticed the plan of redemption, in the second place this morning, let us notice the problem necessitated 
redemption. What is it that brought about? What is it that necessitated that God have a plan to redeem man? Very simply, it was sin. Genesis chapters 1 and 2 tell us the story of creation. And at the conclusion of creation, God observed that all that he had made, everything that he had done, it was good. And he prepared for man the Garden of Eden to be the wonderful home for Adam and for Eve. And it was a place for them to live. It was a place for them to dwell in happiness. We're not told exactly how long this wonderful circumstance lasted. We don't really know how ongoing that was, but we do know this. When we get to Genesis chapter 3, that came to an abrupt halt. That is because Satan arrived on the scene. And Satan has but one objective, and that objective is to destroy the eternal soul of every human being. Peter warned us of that in 1 Peter chapter 5 and in verse 8, when he said, Be sober. Be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. When God placed Adam and Eve in the garden, he did so with very clear instructions. In chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, God said to them, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, and the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. And you know, that is all Satan needed to formulate a plan to lead man into sin. He dangled that forbidden fruit in front of Eve, and then he lied to her about the consequences of eating it. Until she, seeing that it was pleasant to the eye, and there was good for food. And there was good to make one wise. And she took of it. She ate of it. She gave it to her husband, Adam, and he ate of it as well. And the next verses reveal that their eyes were opened. They were ashamed of their nakedness. And now they find themselves on the run from God. But they soon found out that you cannot hide from the all-seeing creator. Now they would have to suffer the consequences of their sin. The close relationship that they had previously enjoyed with God had been severed, and now they had been driven from the garden to toil by the sweat of the brow, to suffer sorrow and pain and childbirth, and death was brought to the human race. The fall of man, by the entrance of sin into the world, necessitated a divine plan of redemption. In the third place this morning, I'd like for us to notice the prophecy of redemption. Notice, if you will, the prophecy of redemption. The Old Testament looked forward with anxious anticipation to two great events. All of man's redemption really hangs upon two great events, and the Old Testament looked with anxious anticipation to those two events. The first of which was the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the second, the establishment of the Church of Christ. Those two things are of supreme and vital importance to the redemption of sinful man. It's interesting to observe what Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 2 and in verse 4. There Peter said, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved and for the judgment, Now, when we read about this first recorded sin, 
When those heavenly bodies sinned against God in heaven, I believe it's important that we take notice of the fact that God did not devise a scheme of redemption. Peter says that when those angels sinned against God, that God did not spare them, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. But folks... When man sinned, it bankrupted heaven. When man sinned, God had a plan in place to redeem man. But it took the best that heaven could provide to pay the price for that sin. Genesis chapter 3 and in verse 1, the Bible tells us, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, You will not. Surely die. For God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he did eat. Folks, this is the first recorded sin of man. We need to understand and we need to see here that when man sinned, God began marching toward Calvary because he had a plan. In Genesis chapter 3 and in verse 15, the Bible says, As God spoke to the serpent, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel." Brethren, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 is God's first hint that he would redeem sinful man. I'm going to go outside the bounds of our restrictions for just a little bit this morning because here's a passage that I believe is extremely pertinent to our study. When it comes to the book of Genesis and really all of redemption, redemption hangs upon two passages of Scripture. The first of which is the one that we just read in Genesis 3 and verse 15. And the second one is Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your kindred, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. When God told Abraham that he was going to bless all the families of the world through his seed, he was talking about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 8, Paul affirmed that when he said, And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the nations by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. But then he went on to say, in verse number 16, Now to Abraham and his seed, or the promises made. He does not say, And to seeds as of many, but as of one. And to your seed, who is Christ. Now, Going on over to Genesis chapter 49, there in verses 8 through 10, we find these words. Judah, you are he whom your brother shall praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down and lies down as a lion, and as a lion... Who shall rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be obedience of the people. In Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, the prophet said, But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, 
Though you are little among thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be a ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. And so we see that the biblical record continues to point out how that uh, Jesus Christ would be the one to be the redeemer of the world. Now in Matthew chapter 1, we find these words. These are the words that we typically come to and say, and those fellows, and move on. But look at what the Bible says. The very beginning of the New Testament says, and the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. Judah begot Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez begot Hezron, and Hezron begot Ram. Ram begot Amminadab, Amminadab begot Nation, and Nation begot Salmon. Salmon begot Boaz and Rahab. Boaz begot Obed by Ruth, Obed begot Jesse. And Jesse begot David the king. David the king begot Solomon by her, who had been the wife of Uriah. Solomon begot Rehoboam, Rehoboam begot Abijah, and Abijah begot Asa. Asa begot Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat begot Joram, and Joram begot Uzziah. Uzziah begot Jotham, Jotham begot Ahaz, and Ahaz begot Hezekiah. Hezekiah begot Manasseh, Manasseh begot Ammon, and Ammon begot Josiah. Josiah begot Jeconiah, his brothers, about the time that they were carried away into Babylon. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconiah begot Shealtiel, and Shealtiel begot Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel begot Abiad, Abiad begot Eliakim, and Eliakim begot Azor. Azor begot Zadok, Zadok begot Achan, and Achim begot Eliad. Eliad begot Eleazar, Eleazar begot Methan, and Methan begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. We wonder why those genealogies are in there. We understand that there's a connection. When the Lord spoke to the serpent and said, I shall put enmity between you and the woman, and you shall be destroyed by his seed. It's important that we know that that was able to take place. We have the record of that genealogy from Noah or from uh, Adam all the way to the birth of Jesus Christ. Now in Hebrews, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 7, there we find, beginning in verse 12, these words. For the priesthood being changed, of necessity there is also the change of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe, from which no man has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of the tribe of Moses, spoke, uh, of the tribe which Moses spoke nothing concerning the priesthood. And so we see that here Jesus is born into the world, and the Hebrew writer says that it's this same Jesus born of the tribe of Judah. That shouldn't have taken place, but yet he is a priesthood, not from the tribe of Levi, but the tribe of Judah. Now, if we're going over to Revelation chapter 5, beginning in verse 5, we read these words. One of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. If we drop on down to verse 12, John said, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the sea and such are in the sea, and all that are in them I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the twenty-four elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. And so we see this thread. And it goes through the scriptures from beginning to end. And it's all pointing toward Jesus Christ. And when Jesus Christ came, he is the one that was prophesied that would be the Savior of the world. Now if we backtrack a little bit and go back to Matthew chapter 16, we see that Shiloh came under the coast of Caesarea Philippi. And he asked his disciples, saying, 
Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they answered and said, well, some say that you're John the Baptist. Some Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him and said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So we see that Jesus prophesied and promised that he would build his church. Now he kept that promise and it was realized on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Now in Acts chapter 2, we find in that great gathering of people, the Bible says in verse 1, Now when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, one on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men of every nation under heaven. When this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them in their own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all of these who speak Galileans? How is it that we hear each one in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene. Visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. Now, there's always someone in every crowd who thinks they've got some smart answer to everything. The Bible says in verse 12, So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, Whatever could this mean? Others mocking said, They're full of new wine. But then Peter. Peter stood up with the eleven. And he gave this explanation of this. He raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day, but this is that which was spoken of the prophet Joel. What is he saying? He is saying, your own prophets have prophesied of this very moment in time. Jesus Christ promised that he'd build his church. It had already been prophesied by those of old that this would happen. And so he appeals to one of their very own prophets here. He points them to the word of God. Now you get down to verse 22, and he talks about the resurrection. And in verse 22, he says, men of Israel, hear these words Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did through him in your midst as yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determined counsel and the foreknowledge of God you have taken by lawless hands and have crucified and you've put to death. Whom God raised up having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. And then he appeals to David. And he points out, this can't be David. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord before my face, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. And he says, this couldn't be David. In verse 29, he says, men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and he's buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus 
God has raised up of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made this same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises to you and to your children, all that are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. And the Bible says that those who gladly received this word were baptized. And verse 47 says that the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. We want to talk about redemption. Beginning in Genesis chapter 3, God prophesied and promised and foretold that redemption was coming. That Satan would be overcome. That he would be devastated and he would be destroyed. And certainly that was the case. When Jesus came, and he suffered and he bled and he died upon Calvary's cross. But as he promised in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, not even death itself, not even the grave itself would keep him from establishing his church. That all nations would be called into that kingdom whereby redemption might be realized. Redemption of man would be accomplished through the seed of the woman, which could only refer to Jesus Christ. It could be no other. Jesus Christ is the only one who would satisfy the prophecies that had been given. David couldn't do that. No other could do that. But Jesus Christ did perfectly. The power of Satan was broken through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The apostle John summed it up brilliantly when he said in 1 John 3 and verse 8, He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now in the fourth place this morning, let us notice the preservation of redemption. And I'm not going to say a lot about this. But we understand that when we get to Genesis chapter 6, that there are some very difficult things that take place. As God looks down on a world that has been saturated by sin. Once sin entered the world, the floodgates were opened and wickedness swept through the human race. How sad do you suppose that the heart of God must have been when he observed the multitudes that had rejected him in favor of wickedness. In Genesis chapter 6, beginning in verse 5, the record says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth. and He was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things, and the birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made him. It would be hard to find a sadder passage of Scripture in all the Word of God. You imagine the broken heart, perhaps the weeping of God over his creation to see the depth of sinfulness that had swept through the earth. Do you know, sin is like a cancer. It never stays the same, but constantly it's growing, and it's destroying everything that it contacts. And that's exactly what wickedness has done to God's creation. It has swept through His creation, and it has consumed the human race. God's remedy was to destroy every living creature by sending a worldwide flood. God's decision was to destroy the world and everything in it and everything that lives and moves and breathes will die. And pray tell I ask, if that's the answer, 
If that's the circumstance, if that's the remedy, then what shall happen to Genesis 3.15? Well, the message of Genesis 3.15 and the seed of the woman crushing the head of Satan in victory, what will happen to that? Thankfully, verse 8 states, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Aren't you thankful for Genesis chapter 6 and verse 8? Aren't you thankful for the man that the Bible calls Noah, that great man of faith, that man who walked with God? And because Noah was a man who walked with God, God commanded Noah to build an ark for the saving of his house from the flood. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 22 tells us, Thus Noah did according to all the commandments that God had given him, so he did. During the time of the flood, not only was Noah and his family preserved safely in the ark, but so was the seed that eventually would redeem sinful man. You know, God's great plan of redemption was devised prior to the creation of the world and the unfolding of that plan is developed through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Redemption is made possible by the death of God's Son who was crucified on Calvary's cross. And all who would render obedience to the gospel that he has given are redeemed back to God. God's great plan God's great scheme of redemption. It ought to tug at our heart. It ought to put a lump in our throat. It ought to bring a tear to our eye. And it ought to bring us to our knees in wonderful thanksgiving and awe that we have a God in heaven that has revealed to us in spite of the fact that he knew that his creation would sin against his will. In spite of the fact that man he understood would turn against him and depart from him. And yet, he created man anyway and loved man so much that he was willing to provide the best that heaven had to offer to make an appeasement for that sin. And because of what God has done in that, And because his son Jesus Christ willingly left heaven and came in this earth, took on the form of a servant, was obedient even to the point of death, the death of the cross, Philippians chapter 2. You and I are able to be saved by the blood of Christ. Through obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel that he has given, that if we'll come to him by faith, repenting of a sinful past, being willing to confess that we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and to be immersed in water for the remission of our sins, we can arise to walk in newness of life and live and die in hope of being with him in heaven forevermore. If you stand in need of obedience to the gospel this morning, the Lord's invitation is being extended to you. If you're an unfaithful child of God and you know that you need to repent and return to Him, will you do that today as we stand?